Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. I am Rory Sackville Hamilton, and I'm here to tell you about the practices of CGIAR centers in the generation, deposit, sharing, and use of digital sequence information for research and breeding. I shall tell you first about the types of genetic data that the CGIAR centers generate and where they are stored and shared, and move on to the conditions under which they are made available. I'll then say a little about how much DSI is used and how CGIAR centers use DSI. And I'll finish off with some lessons learned about how DSI changes the use of genetic resources in agricultural research and development, and a few thoughts about ABS policy implications. If you go back 25 years to the first rice genome to be sequenced, high quality sequencing of whole genomes was outside the scope of CGIAR's mandate, but reference genomes have become so important as a starting point for understanding genetic diversity that CGIAR has now engaged in developing reference genome sequences for many of the crops in its mandate. It's still very expensive and time consuming to do this, and you only need a few reference genomes per crop, so only a very small number of accessions have been sequenced like this. A much larger number of accessions have been resequenced through comparison with reference genomes or genotyped, again for most of the CGAR crops. And a large proportion of the information obtained is available on public databases. Often this work has been done in collaboration with national organizations. Large scale genotyping of genetic resources has been key to enhancing both the conservation and the use of the material genetic resources. I've listed some of the enhancements here, establishing core collections, verifying the taxonomy, identifying gaps in collections and duplicates, and checking for integrity. And to enhance use, identifying useful alleles and candidate genes and identifying donors for specific important traits. Some centers have put in place their own data platforms to facilitate access to genome assemblies, gene annotations, and molecular markers. In most cases, sequence data continues to be made available through public databases, mostly those of the International Nucleotide Sequences Databases Collaboration, but having their own data platforms allows the centers to organize and provide the data, particularly the genotyping data, in the optimal way for their genomes and partnerships. And here is one particular example of a CGIAR repository, that of the Banana Genome Hub. You can see that even with free and open access, you can monitor certain details about use, such as which country the users are in. In the last three months, for example, the largest number of users of this hub have been based in Vietnam, Philippines, China, and Brazil. In general, the centers follow standard academic practices on data sharing. Sequence data are deposited in the databases of the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration, where access is open and free, and they follow the Toronto Statement of 2009 to enable pre-publication data sharing. Specialized portals maintained by CGAR centers don't usually require login, but they do require acknowledgement and attribution, and some also include IPR restrictions relating to the data. One CGAR center does require login and click wrap license agreement for non-exclusive, non-transferable use of genetic data, subject to conditions such as not claiming IPRs over it. That's how CGAR centers deal with the DSI they collect with their partners. What about use of MLS material by others to generate DSI independently of CGAR? There are various possible approaches to investigate this. The most generic would be through digital object identifiers in publications and data sets, including the DOIs of the treaty's global information system. Alternatives could include searching across multiple journals with selected keywords or individual tracking of publications. And these days we could even contemplate automatic AI based methods. Now for how CGIAR centers are using DSI. One area that is becoming increasingly important 
is genome-wide association studies, where you have DSI from multiple whole genomes and look for associations with phenotypic traits. This is proving particularly useful in the context of CGIAR supporting developing countries, as we can adopt a genotype once, phenotype many times approach. So if we genotype a set of accessions and then make both the data and the material available, developing countries can evaluate the material in their own countries for the traits that mattered to them in the environments that mattered to them and with very little extra training, start to look for the genes that are important to them. In IRI, we found that this created a massive increase in demand for genotype material, as what would otherwise have been just a traditional evaluation trial has now become a search for high value genes. DSI has also transformed the breeding process although the DSI are used in a very different way. Here the focus is, using, is on using knowledge gained through research to develop a small number of low-cost genetic markers that you can apply to very large numbers of breeding materials in conjunction with technologies like genomic prediction and gene editing. And then there's capacity building. Capacity building for developing countries has always been a major area for CJIAR centers. DSI-related capacity building has been a natural development, as welcomed by the governing body last year. And here is just one example of many events we run, going through many aspects of genotyping, sequencing, data analysis, and data management for DSI. So now I'll turn to the lessons we've learned. Let's start with the traditional approach, based on conventional in vivo replication of units of heredity, where you cross a female and a male plant to create and select superior offspring. In this case, the incorporation of genetic material into a final commercial product is a sound basis for fair and equitable benefit sharing. And that's what's been negotiated under the treaty and the CBD. DSI completely changes this and we've identified three aspects that have implications for benefit sharing. First is that DSI delinks the use of genetic resources for research from their use for development. Second is that DSI related technologies enable in vitro and in silico replication of units of heredity. And third is that DSI enables discovery of unrelated genetic resources containing the same sequences and I'll go through each one of these in turn. So on the first point, almost all sequence data and most genotyping data and a large and increasing proportion of genetic resources are now used in the research phase to understand the dependence of phenotype upon genotype. I've already mentioned the use of reference genomes and of genome-wide association studies that can involve hundreds or preferably thousands of samples from different countries. The outcome of all this research is the knowledge and tools that are needed more efficient and effective product development. With this knowledge and tools, you can focus on a small set of genetic resources and a small part of their genomes to develop the actual commercial products. This would be a big problem for bilateral benefit sharing based on incorporation of genetic material into products. This would obviously be grossly unfair and inequitable, as it would fail to recognize the value creation enabled through all the genetic resources used to create the knowledge and tools. It's not so much of a problem for the treaty, because we already have a multilateral system which shares these benefits fairly and equitably, including with the countries that have provided the material for research. It's only a problem for the treaty where the knowledge and tools are monetized other than through developing material products. Then we have in vitro and in silico replication of units of heredity. Here I'm referring to genetic modification and gene editing, which enable in vitro replication. And with synthetic biology, we can go a step further. 
replicating units of heredity on computer disks before recreating DNA and incorporating that into material products. Actually, I don't see this as a big problem because neither the CBD nor the treaty define units of heredity, nor do they restrict the processes by which units of heredity are replicated. Hence, it makes sense to acknowledge that they are within scope and you don't need to amend the CBD or the treaty to bring them within scope. You just need appropriate policy. And thirdly, we have the issue that was recognized as a loophole many years ago, that you can use materials from the MLS or other ABS regime during the research phase to discover a desirable sequence and then find or obtain the desired sequence in an unregulated source and use it for product development. So we are forced to conclude that benefit sharing in the era of DSI can only be fair and equitable if it delinks payment obligations from incorporation of DNA sequences into final products, and if it recognizes, reflects, and rewards the value created by DSI through upstream research. I would point out that de facto we already have a multilateral system for access and use of DSI based on a digital infrastructure that facilitates pooling and availability of data from genetic resources worldwide. This is stimulating scientific breakthroughs and is being used to create value at multiple levels. And agricultural research and development is now absolutely dependent on the generation, availability and use of DSI. Just as a reality check, the so-called non-monetary benefit sharing is massive although largely unmeasured. It's just the monetary benefit sharing that needs to be addressed. It's worth adding that the existing multilateral system is intrinsically fair to the extent that the biggest users of DSI from their own countries and from other countries are also the biggest providers of DSI to other countries. So finally, what could delinked benefit sharing look like? It could involve aggregated payments on whole portfolios of products, whether they were developed using access to DSI or not. There could be contributions from users based on a percentage of additional fees for cloud-based services. Or there could be contributions from DSI service providers, providing reagents, sequencing, analysis, and so on. So what next? Well, it's up to you. With that, I'll stop and say thank you.